welcome to another episode of Ask a Pianist. My name is Andrew Ahrens, and today we'll be looking at a topic which is outstandingly difficult to describe, or even define. When we play the music of Mozart, we have to deal with a musical style which, at best, uh, could be described as being elegant. This is an impression that we get as listeners, and we can always tell when it's slightly off or not working the way it should in performance. But what defines elegance? and what purpose does it serve in Mozart? Moreover, is this a style of performing that is separate to the music, or is it something that is inextricably linked to it? In this episode, I'm going to offer a possible way for us to understand this topic, which in many ways exists in the realm of the undefined aesthetic. To understand elegance in piano playing, I think it's easiest to first consider the opposite. What performance style could be indicative of slovenly, lazy, or even unrefined playing? Well, let's use a piece of Mozart's to experiment a little bit. Hopefully he won't hold it against me. The last movement of the B-flat major sonata, K333, is, in my view, the most openly elegant movement he wrote, which means, of course, that it's absurdly easy to destroy. <laughs> Instinct would tell me that to play this piece in a way that was the opposite of elegant would mean that I'd have to incorporate a few performance tactics which circumvent or openly rebel against the musical texture. Forgetting about style for a moment, let's just consider what's in the score. The right hand presents music which is very clearly marked in terms of articulation. We have specific slurs which are varied enough to provide acoustic interest, in addition to the lovely melody that he writes. So, to play this in a non-elegant way, we could either ignore the slurs completely and play it all legato, like this, or we could adjust the slurs and play them inaccurately, sabotaging the phrase. The accompaniment in the left hand appears to support a firm, predictable rhythmic backdrop upon which the upper melody is contrasted against. To play it without elegance would be to remove this firm support. Playing it with lots of rubato is a great option. Putting this together would create a beautifully, laughably inelegant performance. But in all seriousness, what have we actually done? The difficulty in defining playing styles based on a composer, nationality, or genre lies in defining precisely what vectors of interpretation are important to a specific piece. As we gain experience, learning different pieces and different styles, we begin to have a sense of what one should do in a particular style and what one should avoid. But this is not at all written in stone, because, quite frankly, music is so diverse, even within a specific style or piece, that we cannot make generalizations, because there are always examples which break the rule. This lack of a definition that we can rely upon is the cause of all the confusion that we may face as pianists when we're younger and learning this kind of music for the first time. Where I think the solution lies is in understanding what vectors of interpretation we control and why we may choose to exaggerate one over another in a specific musical situation. The previous example may have sounded inelegant by the end, but why? 
what is the actual difference, and what did I do? Let's consider first the right hand articulations, which are so clearly laid out for us. What is the difference between a performance with no slur differentiation and one with attention to the slurs? I'll play one completely legato, and then one with the slurs that Mozart indicates, with everything else like dynamics and rubato kept hopefully rather neutral. Here's the legato version. And here's the version with Mozart's slurs. The difference lies here in the interest to the ear, specifically the increased complexity level that Mozart achieves when his slurs are properly observed. It's like when we speak a language. There's a cadence, a natural rise and fall of a sentence, that attracts a listener to what we're saying. In the same way that it's horribly boring to listen to someone drone on and on with no hope of stopping and no differentiation in their voice, it's horribly boring to listen to music played in the same undifferentiated manner. All that being said, I can still perform this melody observing the slurs, but in a non-elegant fashion, like this. do we have to consider in our interpretation to increase the illusion of playing elegantly? The term elegance, at least when used in music, tends to imply a hidden meaning of refinement or attention to detail. The most common form of elegance we may be used to is the visual one. We see someone who looks elegant, or someone who moves in an elegant manner. But what does this entail? To look elegant is to look unruffled and sure of oneself without looking haughty or like they are trying too hard. All the little details are in place in the costume the person is wearing, and there is nothing out of place or odd about their appearance. Each element of their visual impact is refined and perfected. To move elegantly is to move in premeditated ways, again implying a sense of control over the situation without being domineering. To reach for a cup of tea or to sit down on a chair all of this, done elegantly, would be to achieve these movements without any jerking or sudden corrections. It's very difficult to transcribe this visual sense of ours into one that is auditory in nature, but there are ways. Here's how I do it. Let's consider the first issue of visual elegance. As applied to the opening phrase, we should look at ways to perform this melody with all the little details being in place. This isn't about just playing the slurs at the right time, it's about finishing each slur and starting each one perfectly. I'll play it slowly so you can see what I mean. The first bar has one slur like this. Now, to Mozart and other composers of his era, the use of a slur indicated that the first note was played louder than the subsequent notes under the slur, as if there was a specific decrescendo every time a slur was written. So, to play this correctly, one would have to do something like this. If the rest of the melody is played with this kind of attention, then we could get something like this. When we bring it up to tempo, we now have the first element of attention to detail. The second visual element that I talked about was connected with how we view elegant movement no sudden moves or corrections. 
When playing a phrase with this many slurs, it's very easy to accidentally play something out of line. Because of this, we have to contour very carefully the entire phrase, while integrating all of the little nuances as indicated by the slurs. For instance, the second part of the phrase rises to the cadence like this. If we ignore the slurs for the moment, we have this musical line. Now, when we add in the slurs, we have to keep in mind this behind-the-scenes shape, or a contour, that guides everything. So, no sudden moves, no jerkiness, and the elegance has improved. Attention to detail and contour are not the only elements that require significant attention if we want to create the illusion of elegance. When we think of a person who moves elegantly, and now I'm talking about actually walking around or even running, we tend to visualize a lightness of step, or perhaps a quiet step as opposed to a heavy or plodding foot. Cats, as an example, can move elegantly with ease, but we wouldn't expect the same for a frog. There is, of course, a musical equivalent to this, how we treat our rhythm. Once you establish a refinement in the articulation and shape of a melody, you still have to deal with how you shape the phrase rhythmically. Mozart, in general, relies upon a regular pulse in order for his musical expression to function. His themes cannot be pulled and twisted rhythmically the same way that Chopin's themes can, for instance. But if we play the phrase using a hard, regular pulse, then we run the automatic risk of sounding like a frog jumping from one place to another. The solution, which so many pianists eventually come to through instinct or experiment, is to make sure that although the pulse is regular, the actual beats are very subtle in terms of accentuation. You need to accent the first and third beats in this case due to the time signature, but the accent has to be so subtle as to fall into the background. This also must be refined to a very high level. As an example, we're in cut time, so you should have two beats to a bar. But are these beats equal? Absolutely not. I'll play them exaggerated and equal here, so you can hear what I'm talking about. Now, it's not bad. But because the two are not actually equal, we have to make sure that the second beat is not as prominent as the first. Now, all we have to do is play these beats far more subtly than before, and if all the articulations are followed in the right hand, then we should have something that resembles a kind of elegance. There is another issue of elegance which we must consider. So far, the solution ends up sounding kind of elegant, but still somewhat stilted and rhythmically predictable. This is where experience in playing Mozart comes to a forefront, because the more we play his music, the more we learn to recognize expressive elements he writes into his pieces. Learning where to take time in Mozart is a very important skill to cultivate, and it can come from a variety of sources. Court-style dance music is an important influence in Mozart, as is vocal music and how singers would perform certain notes or phrases. This area is perhaps the most difficult to define, because what we're doing is essentially stretching certain notes or cadences to benefit or increase the expressive power of a musical gesture. The trick is to learn which gestures are important and how we can maximize their potential. 
The halfway point of the phrase represents something very common and typical in Mozart's writings. The cadence is a stopping point of the phrase, which not only divides it in half, but also allows the second half to restart. As this is an important structural, harmonic, and gestural point in the phrase, we can make the decision to slightly stretch the first note of the cadence, which actually allows the note to decay in a very natural fashion within the slur. I'll play it first in an exaggerated form so you can hear what I'm doing. Now, I'll tone it down a bit and make it subtle. By slightly extending this area, we give the illusion of elegance in movement because the phrase doesn't come to a dead stop as if we were plowing through it, but it arrives gently at the climax in a way that seems elastic or organic. This kind of subtle stretching can be done in many other areas as well. Consider the first two bars. They both have slurs on the first two notes, and these can be stretched a little so that the first note of the slur is a little longer than the second in terms of true rhythmic value. I'll play them slowly and exaggerated so you can hear what I'm doing. Now, I'll play them in real time with the stretching being done in a subtle manner. When this is combined with all the other parts of the phrase, you get something which might seem very elegant and typically Mozart. One of the greatest misconceptions about playing elegantly involves what kind of body movements we have that are outside of the sound we create. In other words, there's a common fallacy that if we look elegant at the piano, we'll sound elegant too. This is not a certainty at all, and in fact the appearance of elegance can be used as a visual distraction to hide the lack of elegance in our sound and interpretation. Elegance in Mozart is defined primarily by attention to details of articulation and gesture, refinement in contour and shaping of our phrase, and subtle rhythmic inflections which minimize the explicit regularity of the pulse while simultaneously taking advantage of it. That's all. Easy, isn't it? So, until next time, keep practicing, and remember that just because Mozart is physically easy to play does not mean that it's aesthetically simple. It's usually the opposite. Bye for now.